I'd just like to start this video by stating that I do not in any way condone deplatforming nor the removal of any of the channels or websites that I'm about to mention in this video. This is simply my take and educated analysis on a phenomenon which I have been seeing within the true crime community and online. Please respect the right of these individuals and domains to exist online. Use this video to engage or disengage with them critically as you feel fit. Thank you very much. It's official. A pair of Jeffrey Dormer's spectacles are on sale for a whooping 150,000 US dollars. And that's not all. Described as some of my personal slash coolest items, true crime collector and dealer Taylor James is also selling what is alleged to be Jeffrey Dormer's urn for 250,000 US dollars. All of this and the inflated market value of these items is down almost entirely to the latest installment of the Jeffrey Dormer franchise. And these headlines and articles really brought to my attention a side of the true crime community that is very new to me and isn't often spoken about. When we think of true crime, the conventional names, or depending on your perspective, culprits come to mind. Netflix docuseries, New York Times bestsellers, podcasts, and the household YouTuber names. And this is a very topical discussion on YouTube and the internet at large at the moment mainly because these channels and this domain of entertainment, because it is entertainment, is gaining more traction, not just with viewers, but especially with advertisers being willing to advertise openly on these channels. And this is quite a recent thing. The narrative of a clear-cut moral compass on such matters is as in much disarray as Jack Sparrow's compass. Online sleuths and even psychics are getting in on unsolved cases, discarded cases, and the most high profile. But just before we get into this, I think a palate cleanser is very much in order. Hello, Kidology of the future. Hello, kid from the past. When I tell you that I got more excited than Jay Pritchard's slapping chickens in Modern Family. I mean that I got more excited than Jay Pritchard's slapping chickens in Modern Family. And not much produces that kind of reaction from me, I can tell you that for sure. But when HelloFresh reached out to the channel, I was ecstatic. I have been using HelloFresh for just over two months now, and it is ideal for my lifestyle and my schedule. HelloFresh is a meal kit provider offering a variety of over 30 recipes per week delivered right to your doorstep. It also includes baking kits, which I'm very excited to try and have ordered for next week's delivery. As I said, I I live alone and have quite literally no kitchen. Welcome to Santilla's kitchen. I have one of those little portable ovens with two hobs on top. So eating healthy and eating fresh produce has always been a struggle. And because of my lifestyle, because I live alone, I often resorted to just eating processed foods or just picking up things here and there. The thing with HelloFresh is that not only can I meal prep, but I can meal prep with a vision in mind. I know exactly how much money I'm spending on my meals each week. I can meal prep in advance. I know exactly what I'm putting into my body. And coincidentally, I'm actually learning how to cook for the first time in my life. I can also skip a week or change my meal selections and really cater my package to my needs and wants for whatever my week in life is throwing at me. As a vegetarian, HelloFresh has also offered me a variety of new and exciting recipes and meals. For instance, last week I made the most amazing amazing creamy pesto pasta with baby spinach, peas, and cheese. This was truly scrumptious. I made it in under 20 minutes and I had leftovers for the next day. The stovetop mushroom and leek risotto, delectable, stellar, c'est magnifique. HelloFresh's unique supply chain has actually been proven to reduce greenhouse emissions compared to grocery shopping. So if you want to enjoy the fruits and harvests of HelloFresh, if you want to enjoy fresh produce and just an exceptional amount of meals and recipes and complimentary items, then I highly recommend that you use my link on the screen right now. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code KIDOLOGY65 to get 65% off and free shipping. That is hellofresh.com with my code kidology 65 for 65 percent off plus free shipping thank you so so very much to hellofresh for supporting the channel and for working with me and now in answer to
closer to my grumbling stomach, let me go and eat my stove top mushroom and leek risotto whilst you continue watching the rest of this video. There are a lot of videos on YouTube critiquing or outright criticizing the true crime community. But what I haven't seen is a discussion around gender, especially the gender of creators and their audiences. And this is important in understanding the lens through which criticism is directed. On YouTube, there tend to be, in very generic terms, two camps of true crime content creators. One is heavily female dominated and stands out more due to their particular aesthetic and thumbnails. The creator creates a more personal viewing experience that is also safe. This safety is either enhanced by the setting, a neutral bedroom-esque studio, or the application of makeup, making the storytelling palatable. What I have noticed with these videos is that oftentimes the female content creator features on the thumbnail alongside a picture, a rather dramatized picture, of either the perpetrator or the victim of the crime being spoken about. I have also noticed that the most overt criticism that these creators get after uploading a video is that sometimes their titles are interpreted as misleading. For instance, true crime YouTuber Hayley Elizabeth recently titled one of the latest episodes of her podcast Behind You, The Schoolgirl Killer, Story of Tia Sharp. Many in the comment section noted what I had initially just assumed. This young girl was a killer. In fact, 12-year-old Tia Sharp was murdered by her grandmother's ex-partner, Stuart Hazel, in August of 2012 in New Addington, South London. Hayley Elizabeth isn't exclusive in getting criticism for her particular relaying of facts, her pronunciation of names and places, as well as video titles. I do, however, notice that these female creators get a lot more flack for their content relative to their male-dominated counterparts. And these predominantly, if not exclusively, male-dominated creators make up the other subsection of the true crime community. These are, in contrast, the oftentimes faceless male creators behind channels which take a far more psychological perspective. What is distinct is that their content takes on a more documentary style aesthetic. As I said, the female dominated creators tend to tell a story. They do this by creating a clear chronological narrative of events and by importantly creating an atmosphere that is safe and secure for their viewers, who are typically school aged to young adult women. They also tend to be one woman shows or at least present themselves as such. That that is, they do the research, the scripting, the editing, the filming the everything. Of course, the bigger names have people helping them behind the scenes and people editing their content now, but they all initially started from humble beginnings and definitely keep up that appearance. In contrast, the likes of JCS Criminal Psychology, Stranger Stories, Red True Crime, Explore With Us, and Criminal Psychology are typically careful and meticulous with their research and their presentation. They are primarily a team of creators behind one channel or one brand. So you can assume that a lot of money is being made in order to pay for all the different operations and channels of operations happening. And I'm not being judgmental or petty with this comment. In fact, all the channels that I mentioned after JCS Criminal Psychology are all inspired by JCS, which is an abbreviation for Jim Can't Swim. We can, I would say, quite rightly assume that their inspiration doesn't simply come from from a curiosity in true crime content, but most likely in just seeing the exceptional and extraordinary numbers that JCS Criminal Psychology received when they were on YouTube. The monetary value of true crime content is clear to everybody, particularly the creators themselves. For instance, during one of YouTube's particular purges of this side of the true crime community, Explore With Us put 
put out a community post directed to YouTube and Susan. If true crime is no longer welcome as monetizable on YouTube, we are okay with that and can change our content, but we just need to know. The willingness to openly change content is, I think, noteworthy. Instead of telling a story, an entirely different angle is taken by these more forensic-based, criminal psychology-based channels. They rely on playing sometimes edited down clips of the interrogation process and the trials themselves. The central focus is the war of wits between the interrogators and the perpetrators. Because such footage is in the public domain, these content creators can use this content and can make money from it. This is even when the vast majority of these content creators' videos are made up of this second party footage. It is all about facts, documentary style presentations of what happened, the body language of the perpetrators during their interrogations, the various tactics used by the interrogators, and as I said, featuring edited down clips of the interrogations and trials, which distinguish themselves markedly from the chronological storytelling of their female counterparts. Rather than detailing the lives of the victims and perpetrators of violent crimes, these popular criminal psychologists instead decide to start at the crux of events. Think of Donna Tartt's The Secret History. Tartt used a literary device called In Medias Res, which is a Latin phrase meaning to be in the midst of things. It is the untraditional way to start a narrative, particularly in a detective novel. Tartt begins her magnus opus with the central plot of the story. Bunny Kokoran has been killed, and we know who killed him. And the rest of the story is committed to the who catch him. I do think gender plays into the extent of critique the one group of true crime creators gets relative to the other, at least by their audience. That crucial distinction between the camps has to do with their particular digressing focus on individuals and events. And interestingly, when it comes to the violation of YouTube's community guidelines, the female-dominated true crime content creators fare a lot better than their male counterparts. I think this has a lot to do with, firstly, their relatively modest views in comparison to the infamous JCS criminal psychology, most notably at the time of his and his team's purge from YouTube. And secondly, the way a true crime case is told. Female-dominated true crime content creators have rarely sanitized their content, either overtly or covertly. I've already mentioned the overt ways in which they sanitize their content by their setting, the atmosphere, and of course, the infamous application of makeup. Some of them even cook food and make smoothies. Seriously, last bite. And then we're getting into today's pretty intense story. Mm. Wow. Jinja, wow. So today we're talking about Robert Maudsley. We're talking 27 years cold. Quickly, I think this is a good time to have like a little, another palate cleanser because this shit, I, I just need a break. <laughs> So this time we're going to venture into the unknown and we are adding something salty. Hard pretzels. Hard pretzel? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be terrible. Yet, when I say covertly, I mean that they are able to very clearly convey to their audience that they are distinguishing between the victims, who are innocent, and the perpetrator, who is the embodiment of evil. The focus is typically on his deranged methods of preying on victims. By contrast, it is clear that the victim is the victim. Their story and their life is put front and center for 
the large chunk of the video. Oftentimes, these content creators will put in their thumbnails or sometimes in their titles the word solved, indicating that this case has come to an end, that good has been restored, and importantly, that justice has been served. JCS Criminal Psychology and JCS Inspired Channels start, as I said, at the crux of events, when the crime has already been committed. We are immediately thrown into the main suspect's antics. The focus is on their antics, their emotions, their turmoil during their interrogation and trial. And sometimes the outcome of the interrogations and the trials are not even made known to the viewers. I think what is important to note about both of these groups of content creators is that they are all making hundreds of thousands of dollars. They needn't ask permission from any higher authority, whether that be YouTube or, most importantly and controversially, the victims' family members before covering these cases. JCS Criminal Psychology hasn't uploaded in over a year since YouTube decided to quite literally purge the channel. Yet even with a mere 18 videos left and with, at least in the last 30 days, over 6.6 .6 million views, the channel, if it was still active, would be making at least 17,000 US dollars per month. JCS Criminal Psychology put out a meme slash tweet in August, which I think in a way demonstrates the friction within the online true crime community. If we replace the students who memorize everything with the female-dominated true crime creators who literally memorize information they get from the internet and relay it as a story, replace school with YouTube, and critical thinkers and problem solvers and creatives with the forensic psychology angle of these male-dominated true crime creators, some indirect friction and double standards can be seen. Of course, this is for you to interpret as you feel fit. I can remember seeing people just scattering in different places and running in different places and I was left sitting with Sharon Tate and she was talking to me and I remember that I had absolutely, I could have, I felt nothing, I felt absolutely nothing for her. Um, as she begged for her life and for the life of her baby. So there was a reason why I started with that very long-winded analysis of YouTube's true crime community. And that is because the landscape of the creators and websites that I'm about to mention digress markedly from this very standardized blueprint of the online true crime community, introducing the most notable figures within this small subsection of the true crime community, Jack Webber and Cult Collectibles. Cult Collectibles is not just a YouTube channel, it is also a website and business run by true crime enthusiast and collector Taylor James. And it doesn't end there. So May 21st is Jeffrey Dahmer's birthday and we're going to be doing a sale at cultcollectibles.org. The only person that was touching this for years was Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. Revealing Jeffrey Dahmer's glasses, revealing Jeffrey Dahmer's personal items, unboxing Jeffrey Dahmer's personal items. A comment on one of these videos reads, you two, that is Jake and Taylor, are the only two who can make videos about Jeffrey Dahmer memorabilia at the same time without being disrespectful to the families and victims. Oh my God. Okay. Does it open like you, you uh, let, let it out from yeah, here? Yeah, you just pull it out or okay. slide it up. Oh my God. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Dahmer's glasses. Holy fucking shit, dude. That is legit. It's should I should I try them on? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure? You'll get an instant headache. Oh man, this is fucked. Oh my god, everything is fucked. As I always say on this channel, each to their own. 
I suppose. I think the story of this memorabilia starts more or less in 2001. This was the year that eBay decided to ban the sale of true crime memorabilia after discovering that the artworks of serial killer and rapist Richard Ramirez were being placed on sale by a third party, a true crime collector called Eric Holler. Eric Holler had initiated contact and a correspondence with Richard Ramirez, nicknamed the Night Stalker, a few years prior. This contact and correspondence was started whilst Ramirez was serving his 19 death sentences on California's death row. The two began a correspondence which resulted in Holler agreeing to be Ramirez's informal art dealer. By 2008, Holler had established his own website and collector's domain called Serial Killer Inc. And somewhere around this time, the conventionally known true crime memorabilia or true crime collectibles established the derogatory term murderabilia. The term was originally coined by a victim's advocate in Houston called Andy Cahan. Murderabilia essentially means the exact same thing except that it was intended to be a derogatory term in order to deter people from venturing into this particular market. The term refers to particular items, collectible items or as some call it historical artifacts that are associated with murders, homicides and true crime cases. Notably the items which have accumulated the most market value are associated with the perpetrator as opposed to the victims and it was intended as a pejorative term in order to as I said deter individuals from venturing into this marketplace. However like most things the term has been appropriated or reappropriated by the community itself and is used quite liberally by its members. Andy Carhin is the director of victims at the Houston based Crime Stoppers of Houston, Texas. He also serves as a counselor to the Crime Victims Institute Advisory Council. This council is charged with analyzing, examining and strategizing around crime and its impact on society and most importantly the victims and their families. Carhin's advocacy for victims and his particularly critical outlook on sites such as cult collectibles is noteworthy because it importantly makes a distinction between on the one hand true crime collecting and on the other true crime murderabilia. Collecting is just that. You collect something out of interest for research purposes in order to satisfy some personal, morbid or innocent curiosity. It is for you and it is a hobby. Murderabilia raises a lot of other ethical considerations and concerns because this is collecting not as a venture in and of itself, but in pursuit of either immediate or eventual profit. <laughs> These are prints taken from rare and previously unpublished photos of Jeff and his family. No way. The objective is to make money from collecting, to increase the value of collectibles via an inadvertent or blatant glorification of individual perpetrators, feeding off and gaining from the sensationalist nature of the current true crime scene. Hence the sudden whooping increase in market value of Jeffrey Dahmer's spectacles or one of his spectacles, his reading glasses I believe. The market is growing and this is especially noticeable just because of our technological age and the ever encompassing nature of the internet on our lives. There's greater exposure to these communities and collectible items globally. To outsiders such as myself, this seems to be getting quite lucrative and morally ambiguous. For instance, eBay banned the sale of murderabilia in 2001. However, since the release of Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, the sale of items associated with him has been pretty immense on eBay. Sellers have been profiting quite comfortably by selling dupes of his clothes. Sick merchandise and shoes similar to the ones the serial killer wore are on sale on eBay as viewers are gripped by new series. Banning is clearly 
not doing much in deterring buyers and the curious. And it most definitely isn't doing anything in shifting the framework of the ethical conversation around it. Because Cult Collectibles is not the only website making some hefty profits off the sale of murderabilia. Murderauction.com is another such website. Its branding features a quote allegedly said by serial killer and body snatcher Ed Gein. Every man has to have a hobby. But is that what this is? A hobby. Every second, the bid on items either directly related to a crime scene or, more frequently, a serial killer and perpetrator are updated for potential bidders to peruse, keep a watchful eye on, and to favorite. At one point, you could even purchase a Jeffrey Dahmer victim doll, a dismemberable handmade black skin doll described as 100% cannibal approved and priced at 295 US dollars. For this video, I went deep into murderauction.com and here are some items which I found that are up for sale at the moment, which I would like to conclude with in terms of reflecting mainly on the victims and their families and how they feel. Pretty victim necklace, bra and panties from Brazilian serial killer, 65 US dollars. Pretty young blonde prostitute murder clothing, 49 US dollars. Pretty Mexican college girl clothes, crime scene cute top, 59 US dollars. Jeffrey Dahmer, 4 times 6 crime scene, set of two photographs from the 1980s, 30 US dollars. The description reads that you are getting copies of the two crime scene photographs bought in 1999. Jeffrey Dahmer posed some of his victims in different ways before taking Polaroid photographs of them to keep as souvenirs. Now, consider what I just showed you and consider a tweet that was recently put out after the airing of Monster the Jeffrey Dahmer story. This tweet was written by Errol Perry, the cousin of one of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims, 19 year old Errol Lindsay. I'm not telling anybody what to watch, I know true crime media is huge right now, but if you're actually curious about the victims, my family, the Isbells, are pissed about this show. It's re-traumatizing over and over again. And for what? How many movies slash shows, documentaries do we need? Like recreating my cousin having an emotional breakdown in court in the face of the man who tortured and murdered her brother is wild wild. There's a bit of a mixed message when it comes to the primarily Americanized culture surrounding true crime at the minute. And I think we can see this when we look at the series of tweets by Eric Perry in correspondence to the images which I showed you featured on murderauction.com. Firstly, the market knows best. We must satisfy the market by meeting and responding accordingly to its demand. And of course, this message is very straightforward. There's no need to consider nuance in this, such as how is the demand created or whether it is or is not created, etc. Secondly, we have the socially approved message that serial killers are evil, that they are deranged and that they deserve no humanization whatsoever. We can see this in the fact that such individuals spend the rest of their days either sitting on death row before being executed or in incarceration. On the other hand, we have the unspoken narrative, which is more subtly imbued in the more generalized group of true crime creators and true crime internet sleuths. That is that these individuals are fascinating in being exceptional characters. Celebrity needn't be good or positive. And I would say that whilst this is an unspoken narrative with regards to the true crime content we typically see on the internet and on YouTube. This is quite a liberally spoken about narrative within the murderabilia community. There is a lot of superstition and supernatural sentiments associated with murderabilia. For instance, the belief that the aura of a killer is imbued in the object. I think one thing that the sentiment the market knows best has suggested to me with regards to true crime today is that sometimes 
the market really doesn't know best. For instance, Taylor got a hold of Jeffrey Dahmer's spectacles, his reading spectacles, from a housekeeper who had access to them and wanted a cut in on the profits. Whether this was ethical or right is up for you to decide. Based on some of the responses to Perry's tweets, it makes me wonder whether we have become too desensitized to the pain and suffering of others. That is, not just the unalive victims, but those family members, those friends and loved ones that must live the rest of their days without them. To relive such trauma, remorse, guilt, and unanswered questions is something most of the human population, thankfully, will never have to endure. But these families and individuals do. And because their personal ordeals are now public record, Billions of dollars, and I mean billions, can be made without their consultation and permission. I do think, like with anything, this is a very important, if not crucial, narrative to be having. The diversity of the true crime community is not nearly as appreciated as it ought to be. And of course, in this whole conversation, the victims and their families are the last to be considered and the last to be meaningfully compensated in any humane or ethical way. I would of course love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this matter, on the true crime community and on the murderabilia community particularly. I think it is, although morbid and at least in my opinion, ethically... Uh, I don't think it is going anywhere. I don't think that with the proliferation of true crime content, especially as regards to Netflix is concerned, we are going to see the end of this any day soon. So, as I said, I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much to my patrons and a very big thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Without sponsorships, this channel really would not be in existence. So I thank you so very much for all of your support and I will see you all very soon in the next one.